The Virtual Lead Marketing Conference continues with its focus on loyalty, engagement, analytics, and digital applications. I'm your host, John Karolowski. Thank you for joining us. We have five more presentations today on topics such as e-commerce, joint business planning, mobile marketing, and more. You can stay with us the rest of the day or just log into those presentations that interest you. Our next presentation deals with winning at the virtual shelf, specifically why and how to maximize impact. Now, this conference is interactive. If you have questions, type them in the chat box in the lower left of your screen. We'll answer them along the way as time allows. All registered attendees will be sent links to the presentation recordings and supplemental materials early next week. Joining me now is Keith Anderson, VP of Strategy and Insight at Profitero, a leading global provider of price intelligence and e-commerce insights for retailers and brands. Keith is an analyst and advisor to global retailers and CPG companies, including Walmart, Target, P&G, Unilever, and Coca-Cola. So without further ado, here is Keith Anderson. John, thank you very much, and thanks also to Linda. Uh, thanks to both of you for organizing this conference. Really happy to be participating, and good morning to everybody joining us. Uh, I'm Keith Anderson, and I lead strategy for Profitero. And we are a software as a service company that offers global e-commerce intelligence for retailers and brands. Uh, so briefly, if you're not familiar with us, uh, we were founded in 2010 by former Google and IBM software engineers, uh, and we have deep domain expertise in retailing and CPG. Uh, we're a profitable company and took a Series A round of funding from Polaris Partners, which is based here with me in Boston, Massachusetts, to accelerate our growth and to uh, adapt some of our capability to support brand manufacturers. Uh, we partner with companies like Nielsen and Revionics, and just some of our customers include retailers like Sam's Club and Staples and brand manufacturers like S.E. Johnson and L'Oreal. Uh, so I, I think uh, all of us probably appreciate that there is an incredible pace of change in retailing broadly and CPG retailing at the moment. Uh, and I've, I've had it described – uh, as a period of exponential change, which I think is a, a really apt way to describe what's, uh, what's happening. And so if you think about that word exponential, it really means that as the pace of change accelerates, the scale or the impact increases proportionally. And the complexity of exponential change and technology tends to drive exponential change is that most organizations, including retailers and CPG companies, aren't braced to adapt the organization exponentially. Most of us change incrementally. Uh, so we're managing year to year, sometimes quarter to quarter, uh, and I think there's, there's certainly some risk, uh, but also some opportunity in not changing ahead of the change in this particular period. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I strongly suggest all of you check out the recent report that was co-authored by Boston Consulting Group, IRI, and Google on behalf of the GMA. It was a, a fairly comprehensive study of the current and expected outlook for the online grocery market and online CPG. Uh, and I think the, the stunning takeaway that, that I took from that report was that over the next several years, uh, between 2013 and 2018, online will account for approximately 50% of all CPG sales growth. And despite the relatively low penetration e-commerce has of CPG products today, approximately 1% according to this study, uh, the expectation in the likeliest scenario is that by 2018, 5% uh, will be 5% uh, of all CPG sales will be online. And that within a short period of time after 2018, there's a, a possibility, it's not described in the, in the BCG, IRI, and Google report as a probability, but it's possible that as much as 10% of all 
CPG products could be purchased online uh, by the end of this decade. And quick so, question uh, from one of our listeners, Keith. Quick question: What was the name of the report again? One of our listeners asked. Uh, I, I truthfully don't remember exactly what it's titled, but it, it's a GMA study that was co-authored by Google, IRI, and BCG. So if you search for Google, BCG, IRI, it will be the first result. Very easy to find. Uh, and you'll, you'll notice anytime I reference third-party studies like that, I've attributed the study uh, in, the, in the bottom of the slide. And if you have trouble finding it, just email me. I'll be happy to send you a copy. Uh, so I, I think we all appreciate that it's very early days for CPG online. We're still at very low single-digit penetration, but uh, there's this exponentially growing momentum building. And one of the really important conclusions that I think a lot of CPGs have reached over the last 18 to 24 months is that even beyond the actual dollar volume that e-commerce represents, uh, online is increasingly influential to offline retailing. So here I'm citing two separate studies. On the left is a study by Deloitte that was released in April of this year that found that as of September 2014, approximately 50% of all brick-and-mortar studies have been influenced uh, by digital, and, and uh, they have a pretty – compelling methodology, in my opinion, for how they arrived at that. And, and I should mention they found that a lower percentage of grocery products were influenced digitally. Uh, it's around 33%, but that's still a pretty stunning number, and, and certainly a, a big number relative to the 1% of CPG products that are purchased online. And on the right is another excerpt from that joint Google IRI and Boston Consulting Group study that was done on behalf of the GMA. Uh, and it, it, again, was focused on grocery and CPG and shows that uh, a growing percentage, at least a quarter of offline purchases, had some digital influence from shoppers either uh, researching before they leave home, looking at things like ratings and reviews or other, other uh, pricing, uh, nutritional info, or they're using their phone to research online while they're actually at the store. Uh, so I share these, these studies not because they alone reinforce the idea that digital is increasingly influential of, of offline retail, but if you take those two themes together, that is, uh, from a sales perspective, e-commerce represents a growing percentage of all growth by by this study's estimation, half of the growth, and an increasing share of offline sales are influenced digitally, it starts to underscore why it's so important to understand uh, where you stand in the online landscape. And it, it's uh, been a privilege for me over the last 10 years to work as an advisor and an analyst to many retailers and an, an even larger number of CPG companies uh, many of which are ahead of the curve, in my opinion, uh, in terms of having in place a strategy and organizational support and capabilities to uh, drive e-commerce growth and protect their brand equity in the online retail channel. Uh, and I, I just share here a handful of headlines. Uh, from some of the, the largest global CPG companies, uh, many of which are already investing uh, fairly aggressively in e-commerce. And, and I wanted to pause, if I could, uh, just for those on the line to get a sense, uh, even if you're not personally responsible or working directly with e-commerce, as you think about your, your company's e-commerce strategy and capabilities and had to do a quick diagnosis of where you are, uh, where would you place your company's capability? Do you consider yourselves to be strong and ahead of the curve? Are you pretty good? Uh, you know, we may not be investing way ahead of demand, but we're, we're present and we're working. Uh, are you behind, maybe just getting started, or have you not even started? Uh, and it would be helpful to me just to focus some of my commentary as we go deeper into this. Uh, 
And the result is still coming in, but uh, looks like we have almost neck and neck. We either have a lot of uh, very humble folks on the line, uh, or it sounds like uh, it's about a 50-50 split between people who are pretty good and behind, which is consistent with uh, my, my general read on the industry. Uh, I would say there's a, a discouraging number of CPG companies, maybe 20% in, in my experience, that haven't done anything, uh, which I think is going to be risky because, as, as I'll describe, uh, there is a, a huge advantage in the online channel to those that move quickly because uh, at Amazon and other online retailers, uh, there's this compounding growth that really rewards those that are in early and develop the capabilities to maximize performance in that model. And it's a very different model than traditional CPG and brick and mortar retailer category management and engagement. Uh, it's not to suggest that relationships are irrelevant, but it's a very different skill set and capability that's required to win with online retailers. And now as I look at this, uh, it's about a third of you are pretty good and two-thirds are behind. So uh, that's very helpful. So if you, if you think about some of the competencies and disciplines that have developed to manage the brick and mortar world, these disciplines like category management, shopper marketing, and brand management, you, you start to see that there are some focus areas like on-shelf availability and our brand's share of the physical shelf, the quality of our presence in terms of uh, high-level displays and, and end caps and so on. And truthfully, some of these things have relatively direct comparisons at the digital shelf. Some of these things don't translate quite as well, but it's very straightforward to understand uh, on-shelf availability in the online retail world because most online retailers list on the product page whether the product is in stock or not in stock. Uh, search ranking, you'll see I've, I've referenced here, which is incredibly essential to visibility and findability in the online world because – in a brick and mortar store, you can, uh, you can help shoppers find you based on layout and adjacencies within the format. And then of course, your brand's presence within the aisle and at secondary or off-shelf displays like end caps or action alleys. But as I'll share with you, a huge percentage of shoppers online are searching. And so just as with Google, if you aren't present on page one of those search results for key terms, shoppers won't find you. Uh, product content is essentially your digital packaging. And as I'll describe, that encompasses everything from product titles to images and descriptions. Uh, and, and pricing is a, an area that certainly is important in the brick and mortar world, but it is so critical in the online world because as I'll describe, uh, it's dynamic, it's incredibly competitive, and it's very transparent. So what, what I thought I would do with the time we have together today is share with you what, at least in our opinion, are some of the really critical uh, focus areas that CPG brands need to uh, be committed to to drive performance, not only at Amazon, but with other online retailers uh, and I'll characterize how, how some of what we do at Profitero can be helpful. Keith, before you continue, there's a couple of questions on the points you just mentioned. One of them sure. is for small CPG businesses, small CPG businesses, what are the main channels for sales, the brand's own website or third party? Uh, it's a great question, and I would argue there are certainly benefits to building your own direct-to-consumer e-commerce business. Uh, you have a lot more control and autonomy over how the brand is presented. You maintain that direct connection to your shoppers. But truthfully, your ability to scale and reach a, a large enough audience is very constrained when you go directly to the consumer. 
uh, it's been over 18 months since I double-checked the data, but uh, the last I looked at the data, Walmart.com got 10 times the traffic in a single month that Tide.com got in a full year. And so it's, it's really not a question of uh, either or. I think y you, you have to be thoughtful about the cost and complexity of developing your own direct-to-consumer model relative to the scale that you can really achieve through that model. Okay, one more. Uh, how do you see the often still difficulty to compare products online, as often you get a list of a thousand products on Amazon, where if you stand on front of the shelf, it's much easier? Um, it's an interesting question. So I, I think the question is about the complexity, maybe from a shopper's perspective, of comparing sure. The large number of products listed at the typical online retailer or, or at least at Amazon. Uh, and I would say that it, it's certainly an issue in this abundance of choice in, in the traditional Amazon.com model uh, causes complexity. Of course, there's a lot of functionality in terms of filtering and personalization that Amazon and others have invested in to efficiently present the most relevant products based on product attributes, uh, price, all kinds of factors. But if you look at the right side of this slide in the background, you'll notice Prime Pantry, which is a program that Amazon launched in April of this year. Uh, and it's a very interesting and, and surprisingly, to me anyway, successful program that has a very targeted assortment, just 2,000 CPG products from primarily leading national brand manufacturers. And in that business model, Amazon is beginning to uh, display some more traditional category management competencies and is truthfully editing the assortment down uh, to about as many products as you might find in a, a membership club. And that's not to compare Prime Pantry directly to Costco or Sam's because it's not a knockoff of those models. But I do think that as we get deeper into the maturity curve for CPG, this notion that you're always going to see uh, infinite selection in a traditional Amazon.com model is going to evolve because the economics of selling lower price point products like CPG products isn't sustainable in some of those models. Okay, a few more questions that we'll save to the end, Keith, so uh, why don't you continue? Perfect. Uh, so let me start with pricing, not because uh, pricing is necessarily most important, but it's certainly important to understand. Uh, and if you're familiar at all with our company, we have a heritage in competitive online price intelligence. So uh, we, we are uh, headquartered in Ireland, and we run – uh, online competitive price intelligence programs for several of the largest UK and French grocers. Uh, most, most recently, you may have seen Morrison's, one of the big six UK online grocers, publicly launched a program called uh, Match and More, which is unique in the UK because for the first time, they're actually matching not only core competitors like Tesco, Asda, Waitrose, they're actually matching Aldi and Lidl, the, the very rapidly growing discounters, on like-for-like -like products. So part of our capability, because those prices reside on online product pages, is the ability to monitor millions of those product pages on a daily basis so accurately that these retailers can actually make customer-facing claims about uh, their price competitiveness. And we recently did uh, a simple study in a handful of categories. Here I've selected health and beauty, uh, and I'm only comparing Amazon to Walmart.com over a one-year period running from September 2013 to August 2014 on a sample set of just over 750 products that are exactly the same. So 750 identical health and beauty products at both of these online retailers in the U.S. for the last year. And you can see that 
on a monthly basis per product, both of these retailers tend to change the price uh, uh, close to once a month, although Walmart is, is uh, at about half that number. Amazon is changing prices between four and five times per month on every individual product. Uh, and I think the dynamism of online pricing is even clearer in this next slide, which is actually a screenshot that comes directly from our application. Uh, so here we're looking at a, a specific product and its pricing history over about a six-month period. And I realize it's probably a little tough to see at the scale that you've got the slides here. But you can see that we're comparing several online retailers, including Amazon's first-party and third-party marketplace. Uh, and you can see that there are a, a large number of uh, peaks and valleys, and that there's clearly uh, some responsiveness between competitors when prices change. And so uh, we, we deal with a large number of manufacturers who have found that the dynamism and the transparency of online pricing leads to disproportionate tension with their trading partners. That is, they may have buyers from some of their largest brick and mortar customers calling to say, listen, we see some really erratic, irrational pricing at online retailers like Amazon. And uh, we, we don't understand why you're offering those products at a better price to Amazon than to us. And while we're not going to cover all of the response strategies during this session today, I would tell you I think it's, it's wise as a manufacturer to have equal or, or better intelligence about your products and even your competitors' products pricing on a daily basis across some of your largest and most visible online retailers. Uh, and the reason, I think, is, is pretty clear. The prices are changing continuously, and they're transparent to shoppers. And I, I, I see there's a question about how important price perception is to online shoppers. And I would say uh, it's important, but it's not necessarily the most important thing. Uh, we're not a shopper insight or a, a consumer research company, uh, but I've seen data that suggests uh, among the most influential things that shoppers consider when they're researching grocery products online is price, uh, but it, it's not always the most important. Uh, and, and I think if you ask me, is it more important to shoppers or to trading partners, I might even argue it's, it's the latter. It's more important to your ability to manage your, your channels strategically and manage relationships, and whether or not you have a minimum advertised price policy, uh, a MAP policy, uh, especially if you do, it's, it's essential to understand what the, the longer term trends are, but especially on a daily basis, where the most erratic pricing is taking place on which products. Uh, because you need to use facts to manage the, the conversation with your retailers. So part of what we do for our manufacturing customers is monitor their products online on a daily basis and help them identify products that violate the, the MAP policy they have in place, if they have one, or simply identify really erratic pricing if there are products that are uh, disproportionately priced higher or lower than average pricing for that product. Uh, so I, I want to jump now to product content, which as I said a, a little bit earlier, is really best thought of as your digital packaging. Uh, and the beauty of e-commerce is that you don't have to spend as significantly on physical packaging that pops or that sells from the shelf. You can actually use images, uh, descriptions, product titles to uh, really efficiently sell from this digital product page. And as I'll describe, this becomes pretty important to your ability to rank more favorably in search results. So this is a vast oversimplification, but it's, it's important to understand that there are essentially two types of content for 
online retail, and, and this is using Amazon as an example, and this A-plus content term is definitely an Amazon term. So this doesn't translate to every retailer that you work with, but it, it, it's a conceptual way to think about this. Basic content is, is typically structured. It's these, these fields like product title and descriptions, and it's typically free for a manufacturer to provide it to their online retailers. Uh, it, it definitely influences search results, and we'll spend a few minutes on that in more detail. And then you have this A-plus content, which is an, an Amazon term for uh, premium content for which Amazon charges a fee. Some other retailers don't charge a fee but allow for similar content to be supplied. And it includes things like feature benefit comparison tables across different mod models of your products, uh, video and other rich media, and it typically enables a higher level of customization. Uh, there are a lot of reasons to invest in A-plus content, particularly for uh, families of products that have some important distinctions between them, and, and you want to help your shoppers make the right decision between some of those different options. But for the sake of today's discussion, I wanted to emphasize basic product content because uh, it is, in our experience, even more influential to both uh, your search ranking and to conversion rates. And I'm not going to step you through every one of these suggestions for how to optimize your content, uh, but I would tell you, you know, there's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of interesting insight that we've discovered in the work that we've done uh, supporting manufacturers and comparing. Uh, attributes of their content to higher performing products. Uh, so y you, you certainly want to optimize your product titles to include all of the really key attributes, including your brand name, any specific uh, coloring, flavor, size, quantity. Just put yourself in the shopper's shoes and think of what the shopper might be trying to understand about what specifically they're buying. Uh, and there are markets internationally that are starting to regulate the, the information that's required of manufacturers in some of these fields. Uh, the description should be really clear, uh, and it's, it's uh, often a tendency we observe in manufacturers to use content that is marketing-driven, tends to be full of buzzwords, and tends to be uh, a, a little bit heavy-handed, and our experience tells us using plainer language uh, and and describing the product and especially features and benefits in the vocabulary that a shopper uses uh, drive conversion more significantly. So uh, I, I realize we have a couple quick questions here. Let me wrap the content discussion up, and then we can take a few of those questions. Uh, we, we would tell you that if you don't already have brand standards or a style guide for your online product content, uh, it's a, a really essential step to take. And so if you don't have a framework that you've given to all of your account teams, uh, it, it's important to be sure that the folks responsible for listing new products and managing how the brand is represented in online retail are familiar with those standards. Uh, I see a question, how easy is it to update this information with the e-retailers? The general answer is it's not that easy. We see lags of up to two or three months with some online retailers, which is why my second point over in the so what column is to consider working with digital asset management or product information management platforms like Salsify or Quickie or Gladson that can help you syndicate that product content out to your online retailers more efficiently. And there's really interesting and important work going on with some of the standards bodies like GS1 to try to introduce some standards that might make this more efficient uh, for manufacturers across retailers. And, and we're proud to be part of that work as well. Uh, I think it's, it's important to audit your online retailers continuously 
for compliance and execution of this product content. And I think there's a tendency to want to do this at a point in time uh, and then focus in, uh, in the short term on making some improvements. Uh, and, and I would tell you, uh, you really want to be monitoring this on a continuous basis. Uh, and for our customers, we monitor your product content on a daily basis because you're, you're very likely to have so much churn in terms of uh, physical packaging changeovers, new product launches. Just think of the churn rate of your product catalog uh, in, a, in a given year. You know, we, we work with customers who have hundreds of new products launching within a given year and in just as many being retired. And so uh, the most successful customers of ours are continuously observing uh, online retailers' sites and just validating whether the product titles, the images, the descriptions meet the criteria that they've established in their standards and style guides. Uh, and, and lastly, we think it's important to understand in your specific category uh, the levers you can pull that drive performance. So uh, we did a little bit of quick research for, for today's session that I wanted to share with you. Uh, and we looked at just three categories on Amazon. These are the top 20 best-selling products on Amazon for a specific date, uh, October 28th. And, uh, these are just a handful of attributes. But you can see that in categories like chocolate and toothpaste, the uh, number of images seems relatively highly correlated to performance. That is, uh, shoppers seem to appreciate seeing at least three images of the product. And you'll also see word count uh, length for the description of products in these same categories. Uh, and, and we share this because part of what we do for our customers is enable the analytics of attributes like these, typically over a longer time range, uh, to get a sense for how, how within your category you can influence uh, conversion rates and make an impact on, on where you rank within search. Uh, and, and I see a quick question about the basic product content in the two or three uh, most important criteria driving SEO. Uh, let me let me come to that momentarily. It's a very helpful setup because uh, truly online shoppers are searchers. Amazon uses this term called spearfishers to describe their shoppers, uh, and what they mean is that the the typical Amazon shopper knows what they want when they get to Amazon's site. And they, they more often than not use the search box to find it as opposed to browsing through the category hierarchy uh, or shopping by department. That's not always the case, but Amazon shoppers are heavily search driven. And so it really is important to rank uh, favorably for the right search terms. And again, just comparing and contrasting offline to online when you think about placement in the brick and mortar world, it really does come down to where your category sits within the formats layout and adjacencies, uh, your primary display placement. Are you at eye level? Or are you at the beginning of the aisle or the center of the aisle? How many facings do you have? Uh, when you think about the online shelf or the digital shelf, it's much simpler. It's really uh, where you rank at the online retailer's search results and where your category is placed in terms of uh, number of clicks to reach the category through a hierarchy, uh, and then where your brands actually show up on a category page or a department page. So you asked this question about, uh, or, or someone asked a question about what really drives uh, SEO, which stands for Search Engine Optimization. And this is really uh, a focus on driving search ranking at Amazon. Uh, and it varies retailer by retailer. But I think this is instructive when you're trying to think about how to drive your search performance. Uh, so these are Amazon terms. And Amazon uses this term called uh, 
search ranking, or excuse me, relevance. Uh, and relevance is driven primarily by the, the product content, which is your titles, your bulleted features, and your product descriptions. And so part of what we help our customers do is some analysis on the right keywords uh, that are, that are uh, the most heavily searched and that are the highest density in products that are ranking really favorably in search. Then in the lower left, you'll see this term glance views, and that's another Amazon term that refers to page views, essentially. Uh, and so Amazon quite simply wants to show you products when you search for a specific term that are relevant, but also products that other people are looking at. So think of it in a simplified way as, as page views. And the third factor is conversions or sales rank within your category because Amazon doesn't just want to show you products that are relevant and people are looking at if the conversion rates, that is the ratio between people that look at the product and ultimately buy the product, is really low. So they want to maximize the, the conversion rate uh, so, that you see, uh, so that you see the products that are likeliest to convert. Um, and, and there's a question about how Amazon calculates glance views. And I would tell you, I don't know the precise formula. Uh, it is liberal, and there was a comment, you know, the numbers that the person asking the question have, have seen are very high, and compared to traditional page views, that's the case. Uh, I do know that the way Amazon defines a session is uh, over a 24-hour period. Uh, so I, I, I wish I had more detail on that one, and I, I could try to help you answer it. But conceptually, you do want to maximize the traffic that goes to your product page, which you can do through targeted promotions, where to buy links from your own brand.com site, uh, all kinds of programs that Amazon can support you with. And you want to be sure that your product content is optimized for conversion so that you've got all the right information concisely provided in your product titles. You've got high quality images that are really clear and easy to see, and you've got descriptions that answer all the questions about features and benefits. And again, uh, we, we did just some very basic analysis, again, for these same three categories on October 28th, and looked at for the, the search of that category, so if I go to Amazon and I search for dog food or toothpaste or chocolate, what percentage of the top 20 best sellers in that category appear on page one of search results? And you'll notice it's a, it's a relatively significant relationship, especially in dog food on this particular instance. Uh, so th this is high level data that that may or may not apply to your specific category, but I would tell you it's important to understand over time how you rank for the right terms in your category. Definitely for terms related to your brand, definitely for terms related to the category, and lastly for terms related to specific product attributes that your brand or your product has and competitors may not because a really important distinction between searching or researching on online retailer sites compared to Google is that the shopper on Amazon is further down the, the path to purchase than somebody who's just beginning to research on Google. Uh, so just, just to reiterate, we think it's really important to continuously monitor where your products rank within online retailer sites for the right terms related to your brand, your category, and product attributes. And you really have to get into this virtuous cycle of enhancing and optimizing your product content based on that intelligence about where you rank. Uh, and that's part of what we're doing for, for our customers. John, was, was there another question before I well, jump to this section? Of 
Sure. There were a couple of questions, Keith. I was saving to the end so you have enough time to finish your slide, but we can answer them now if you'd like. Uh, one of them uh, was, uh, in your view, what impact will Amazon have on the growth of grocery e-commerce? And, uh, and a related question was, what are the selling what are the leading e-commerce vendor tools for small, medium-sized CPG websites to sell direct? Sure. Okay. Uh, let me take the first one, which is what impact will Amazon have? Uh, I think Amazon is going to have a profound impact, and uh, there are two things happening at Amazon that I think underscore their commitment to grocery and CPG, one of which is the Prime Pantry program that I mentioned. Uh, which anecdotally is now accounting for between 10 and 30 percent of the total business some leading CPG companies are doing with Amazon. So uh, I, I've been very surprised over these last six months since Prime Pantry launched at how successful it's been. Uh, and Amazon has certainly given it some support by uh, juicing search results to favor Prime Pantry products. Uh, but, you know, Prime Pantry is, is – uh, it's got a brighter future than I initially thought it would. And the second is Amazon Fresh, which is Amazon's full basket temperature-controlled online grocery service uh, that originated seven years ago in Seattle and then expanded last year to California, San Diego, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and just recently expanded to the East Coast in Brooklyn, New York City. So uh, when you look at those two programs and the capital commitment uh, that Amazon has made, I think it really sets the stage for that long-term commitment to CPG from Amazon. And then if you look at other models like Instacart, uh, and, and just yesterday uh, Door to Door Organics announced $25 million in funding, uh, there is a growing number of well-funded uh, new companies, startups, as well as uh, long-standing, very experienced operators like Peapod that have not just the endorsement but the mandate from their parent companies to grow. And in, in my experience studying the industry, uh, some retailers are motivated by shoppers' attitudes and, and behaviors, and others are motivated by their competition. And what I'm observing now is the competition and the availability of online grocery is increasing so quickly that you're starting to see even some of the, the industry leaders like Kroger that have historically resisted uh, now making acquisitions of pure play online retailers uh, like Vitacost as well as cautiously introducing click and collect models. So uh, I, I, I think there's a reason you hear this chorus of third party firms uh, that are uh, research and advisory firms that are starting to uh, call this as an inflection point. And then the, the, the second question around uh, the best tools for smaller CPG companies to go direct to consumer. Uh, I, I have to admit, I'm not an expert in direct-to-consumer, particularly for smaller uh, CPG companies. I would suggest, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, companies like Brick Meets Click and uh, a handful of others, they, they, they seem to have some expertise in that area. Uh, so you may want to check out some of the, the folks that are focused on uh, – smaller scale CPG companies and direct to consumer. Sorry, I can't be of more help there. Okay, why don't you continue, Keith? We've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Perfect. So I'm just going to hit on, uh, on this last piece, and I got ahead of myself. Uh, you know, we, we, we spent a lot of our energy thinking about ratings and reviews at Profitero because I'm sure many of your companies now understand social media is a, a big deal and can influence that brand equity and sales. But if you think about the half-life of a Facebook like or a tweet, it's pretty short. Uh, I don't know if any of you are on Twitter, but uh, 
even discovering or, or searching for a tweet that you yourself sent three or four months ago is not an easy thing to do. But if you think about ratings and reviews that reside on product pages, uh, they have an incredibly long half-life. And so uh, whether they're favorable or unfavorable, they're there in a cumulative way for the long term. Uh, and every study I've ever seen that looks at the hierarchy of uh, influence that various sources of information have puts ratings and reviews at the top or close to the top as compared to paid or similar uh, forms of media. So a growing number of our customers are awakening to the importance of ratings and reviews, and they're, they're really focusing in two areas. One, they want to be certain that their products, especially their highest potential or highest performing products, have an adequate number of ratings and reviews. Uh, and secondly, they really want to identify when products receive negative ratings or negative reviews, many of which may not even be directly related to the product. In other words, on Amazon in particular, uh, you get all kinds of issues with uh, complaints about the third-party merchant that sold your product and whether they sent the right product or delivered it when they said they would. And, and regardless, it becomes pretty important to look at uh, – you know, to look at what your products, ratings, and reviews are on a daily basis, and especially to find out quickly if you've got negative reviews. So again, we, we took a look at these categories, uh, and you can see in a category like chocolate, we don't need a huge amount of persuasion, uh, at least not as much maybe as we need in dog food or toothpaste. Uh, but uh, when you look at the average star rating for the top selling products, you certainly start to see a correlation between uh, uh, star rating and performance. And, and it's, it's definitely not causal. At least the data we have couldn't be used to draw causal conclusions because naturally you might assume that the products that are the, the highest performing from a sales perspective tend to be products people like. Uh, but you know, there's a very thoughtful question here that says, uh, what is the, wh what's the minimum number of uh, ratings or reviews that you need? Uh, and I've seen data from others that suggest once you get above 20, that has an impact on conversion. But as we've looked at some of our customers' numbers, uh, the, the number tends to be much higher in some categories. Uh, typically several hundred as a minimum. So uh, it really depends on your specific category, and I think it's important to do some of that analysis of, uh, you know, in your category and for your specific portfolio, what is the relationship between, um, between those, those, two, uh, those two factors. And I see another question, which specific studies mention the importance of ratings versus paid media? Um, my email will be at the end of the presentation here, and if you don't mind, uh, just send me an email, and I've got a whole list of all the studies that I've kept track of on that point, and I'll send them over to you uh, really quickly because I was asked the same question recently. So uh, if anybody else is interested, just send me your question, and uh, I'll send those to you. So, so let, me, uh, let me just conclude the ratings and reviews discussion by reiterating uh, you definitely want to be able to identify negative reviews and respond quickly. And you may not have the complexity to, um, to manage all of the products that you sell online. So we advocate prioritizing based on volume or you know, your highest performing products. And it, it's, uh, it, it's becoming increasingly common if you have a call center or a customer service team uh, that is already conversant in the products and all of the regulations and legal limitations on what you can and can't say during customer service interactions, uh, you, you can very simply uh, funnel some of these alerts about negative reviews to a customer service team who may be 
the best equipped to respond. Uh, and then we would also coach you to think about some of the programs in place at retailers like Amazon and Walmart. Amazon has a program called Vine, which is a program that lets you send free sample products to uh, Amazon shoppers that have written a high volume of reviews in the past. And it's not a quid pro quo in any kind of formal way. So the people receiving these free samples don't necessarily have to review your product or review it favorably, but they do know that their eligibility to receive product samples in the future is related to the number of reviews they've written. And so you pay a, a fee per sample that you distribute, and you also absorb the cost of the sample naturally. Uh, and Walmart has a very similar program that they've launched. You can also do things like this independent of those retailers. So I don't mean to suggest you have to necessarily throw funds at any individual online retailer. But uh, if you're launching a new product or if you identify really key products that don't have enough reviews, this might be something you could do. Uh, so let me let me wrap up here. And I'm glad to see we do still have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, you know, the, the takeaways, I hope, you, you take from this morning's session are that online is the fastest growing sales channel for CPG, at least on a growth rate basis, uh, but that according to some third-party estimates, even on a dollar basis, uh, online will account for approximately half of the growth between now and 2013. And even beyond that dollar growth, uh, offline sales are increasingly influenced by the way your brand is presented at the digital shelf. Uh, and in our opinion at Profitero, uh, just as most manufacturers have developed the uh, fact-based approach to managing the brick and mortar business, you need the right intelligence to manage your online business. Uh, and, and that drives to uh, pricing, which is, as we've said, is really dynamic, competitive, and transparent online. Uh, you definitely need to focus on uh, on your product content, which is your digital packaging. Uh, you definitely want to make sure that you are visible in the right places, especially your search ranking on online retailer sites. And you definitely want to understand and act on the, the ratings and reviews about your product. Uh, so, the last thing that I will share with everybody is uh, how Profitero works with our customers. Uh, we are a, a software as a service company, essentially. Uh, and so most of our customers initiate a trial, which actually lets you test drive the capability uh, with a limited scope. So you, you pick some number of products that you want us to monitor. Uh, and we, we make it easy to get involved by billing you only for our costs. Uh, and then if you like what you see, most of our customers enter into uh, annual agreements that give everybody in their company access to our e-commerce intelligence portal, where analytics and guidance about every area I've described uh, for your brands and the competitive brands that you ask us to monitor is accessible by anybody in any market. Uh, and you know we have some customers that are monitoring a few hundred products in a single country. We have other customers that are monitoring thousands of products in more than 20 countries globally. So uh, it, it really is scalable based on what your needs are. And then uh, while most of our customers uh, really focus on the self-service through the application itself, uh, I lead a team of experienced data analysts that can help you manage some of the analysis and will produce insight for you. Uh, if you don't have the time or the internal headcount to make the, the highest use of the data that's produced by the software. Uh, so that's a team of folks that can help you answer the so what and the now what about the data, uh, and that's typically billed as a separate charge on top of the, the software itself. Uh, so I, I really appreciate everybody's time and attention this morning, and uh, grateful again to John and Linda for putting together such a great event. 
Uh, my contact info, since uh, I think a few of you have asked, is here. Uh, I'm on Twitter, at Keith Anderson, and email is Keith at Profitero.com. And since we do still have a few minutes, uh, would love to answer any remaining questions uh, that, sure. that anybody one has. Sure, question that came up. One question came up earlier, Keith. Uh, to what extent has concern about ordering fresh goods hindered the growth of grocery e-commerce? It's a, it's a great question, and I'd say it's been profound uh, for two reasons. One, uh, there's definitely a, a, an issue of quality perception or freshness perception when shoppers are thinking about placing an online order. But the, the more experienced online grocers like Fresh Direct and Peapod uh, and even Instacart now have developed sophisticated approaches to providing daily freshness ratings for produce so that you have uh, real visibility into how fresh today's produce will be. And they've also introduced substitution policies that are really shopper friendly so that uh, if they don't have produce that meets your quality threshold, uh, they'll, they'll substitute something uh, close but cheaper uh, and they tend to bill you the lesser amount. Uh, so I, I think uh, it's getting more straightforward based on a lot of experience that's accumulated. Excellent. Thank you, Keith. That was truly outstanding about this brave new world of CPG sales that we're heading into. Our next presentation, Where Does the Real Power of Technology Reside?, will begin on the hour in a few minutes. Please join us. This is John Karolewski signing off for Profit Hero and the Shopper Technology Institute.